untap your full potential with the untapped deck tracker. Both the in-game overlay and the personal stats provide a lot of value. Download it for free today using the link below and you'll be supporting the channel at the same time. Hello and welcome to another Historic Games video. Today we're taking a look at a colorless ramp deck featuring four copies of Ugin the Spirit Dragon, which has recently been banned in Historic Brawl, so now Historic is pretty much the only format you can still play it in. The 8 mana Planeswalker starts out at 7 loyalty and then can plus 2 to deal 3 damage to any target. The minus X is incredibly powerful, exiling each permanent with mana value X or less, that's one or more colors. So this is often a one-sided board wipe, especially powerful against the Enchantress deck, where we can potentially exile a 9 lives which has hexproof, so Ugin is one of the few ways to get rid of it and then essentially win the game on the spot. And then the minus 10 ultimate says we gain 7 life, draw 7 cards and then put up to 7 permanent cards from our hand onto the battlefield. So Ugin the Spirit Dragon is what we're ramping into. Of course getting to 8 mana is going to be quite the challenge in Historic, which is a pretty fast format where a lot of decks can kill on turn 4. So to get there we need some ramp. Starting out at 2 mana we've got 12 different 2 mana ramp artifacts. And when deciding whether to keep or mulligan a hand, I pretty much always want to have at least one of these 2 mana artifacts in my hand, so I can guarantee 4 mana on turn 3. Of course Mindstone is the best of the bunch, as we can tap it right away. Can also sacrifice it to draw a card in the late game once we have all the mana we need. Then Guardian Idol comes into play tapped and can turn into a 2-2 Golem Artifact creature until end of turn, giving us a little bit of pressure in the late game, very good at pressuring opposing Planeswalkers as well. And then Cold Steel Heart is definitely the weakest in this deck as it enters the battlefield tapped and then as opposed to making colorless mana we have to choose a color so it doesn't synergize with our Forsaken Monument which is another important card in the deck but again we just need that consistency of having these two mana artifacts in our opening hand so we've got all 12 of them. Then at 4 mana we can potentially play a turn 3 Hedron Archive, which then taps to add a double colorless to our mana pool, so we can potentially play another 2 mana artifact in the same turn, and then we can also sacrifice it to draw 2 cards in the late game. And then by going turn 2 ramp artifact, turn 3 Hedron Archive, play another 2 mana artifact, we can potentially cast a turn 4 Ugin, the Spirit Dragon, if we don't miss any land drops, so that's why Hedron Archive is so powerful in the deck. Then another great card to play on turn 3 is Karn, the Great Creator. The passive ability shuts down any activated abilities of artifacts the opponent controls, so great in the mirror match especially, this is one of the best cards, and also shuts down artifacts like the Witch's Oven out of the Sacrifice deck, which is nice. Then we can often minus 2 to search up an artifact card out of our sideboard. So now in best of 1 we have a 7 card sideboard to choose from, so Karn's not quite as powerful as it used to be when we had more selection, but for now we're playing Tormod Script as a card we can potentially search up and play right away. Very important against graveyard combo decks, where we might not have time to untap with Karn and then play a 1 mana Gravedigger's Cage instead, which can also shut down cards like Collected Company, Bolas' Citadel, so it does have some additional utility. But on the other hand, sometimes the opponent will cast a Mystic Mastery, which will exile a card from the graveyard and then cast it, so that does get around Gravedigger's Cage, so we're better off with the Tormod Script. And same goes for a card like Indomitable Creativity, which also exiles the card first, so it also gets around Gravedigger's Cage, although it's not like Tormod Script would really help there either. Then we also have Ratchet Bomb, which is very similar to Blast Zone, which we have four copies of in the mana base. The main difference is that Ratchet Bomb can potentially destroy all tokens, because it doesn't come into play with any counters on it, so a great way to clean up any tokens that the opponent might have in play, and then can also be a nice versatile card that can destroy larger permanents over time. Then at 5 mana we've got additional copies of cards we also have in the main deck, since we have 3 copies of Golos and Forsaken Monument, with a 4th copy in the sideboard, and then we can potentially search those up and play on the following turn thanks to Karn. And then at 6 mana there's Godfarer's Statue, a legendary artifact saying spells your opponent's cast cost 2 generic mana more to cast, and at the beginning of your end step each opponent loses 1 life. So this can be very punishing against any combo decks that need to cast multiple spells in the same turn, and once we generate a big mana advantage early on, Godfarer's Statue can kind of secure that advantage for the rest of the game. And then Platinum Angel is also very important, can often beat creature decks that don't have any removal, as it says you cannot lose the game and your opponents cannot win the game, so as long as Platinum Angel stays in play, it will buy us time until we find another way to win the game, assuming a 4-4 flyer is not enough. 
Then at 5 mana we already alluded to Golos, Tireless Pilgrim, a 3-5 legendary creature. When it enters the battlefield, let's just search our library for a land card and put it onto the battlefield tapped. And of course we've got a lot of powerful utility lands to choose from. The one we're going to search up most often with Golos is the one copy of Cascading Cataracts, which taps for colorless mana, is indestructible, but we can also pay 5 mana, tap it, and add 5 mana in any combination of colors, which we can then use to activate Golos' ability for 2 generic mana and 1 of each color. We can exile the top 3 cards of our library and play them this turn without paying their mana costs. So we can also play lands and cast powerful 8 or even 10 mana cards for zero mana, which is quite powerful. We'll even get the cast trigger of Ulamog, which we'll get to in a second. So a great source of card advantage can essentially ramp us when it comes into play, and a 3-5, also not a bad blocker. And then we've got three copies of Forsaken Monuments, saying colorless creatures we control get plus two plus two. Whenever we tap a permanent for colorless mana, we add an additional colorless mana, which is why Cold Steel Heart is not quite as synergistic with it. And whenever we cast a colorless spell, we gain two life. So this kind of does it all and often allows us to ramp into an Ulamog or Ugin on the following turn. And giving our creatures plus two plus two is also quite relevant with cards like Guardian Idol and some of our creature lands that are also colorless. Even the tokens from Ugin, the Ineffable and Golos will also get that plus two plus two bonus. And then at six mana we've got two copies of Ugin, the Ineffable, with a passive ability making colorless spells we cast cost two generic mana less to cast. So this is another way of essentially ramping into our more expensive cards. Can even play our two mana artifacts for free after playing Ugin. Then the plus one exiles the top card of our library face down, and we can also look at it, and that is a 2-2 colorless spirit creature token, and when it leaves the battlefield we can put the exiled card into our hand, and the minus three is more removal, destroying target permanent, that's one or more colors. Then we've already covered Ugin, and then last but not least, two copies of Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger, the 10-10 legendary Eldrazi, since when we cast it, we exile two target permanents, so even if the opponent counters Ulamog, we still get to exile two permanents. It's indestructible, and when Ulamog attacks, defending player exiles the top 20 cards of their library, so if the opponent gains infinite life, we can still maybe kill them by milling them out with Ulamog, and having them draw from an empty library. Then the mana base has a whopping 26 lands, despite all the extra artifact ramp, still 26 lands, because we really cannot afford to miss a land drop in this deck. And then we have a bit of a life gain built in, with four copies of a Radiant Fountain, gains two life when it enters the battlefield. Then Crypt of the Eternals is basically a weaker Radiant Fountain in this deck, only gains one life when it enters the battlefield, but also makes colorless mana for Forsaken Monument. And then Interplanar Beacon gains one life whenever we cast a Planeswalker spell, and with 10 Planeswalkers in the deck this will often gain a few points of life. And then also a singleton copy of Inventor's Fair, which is legendary, and says at the beginning of our upkeep, if we control three or more artifacts, we gain one life, and we can also pay four mana, tap and sacrifice it to search our library for any artifact card, reveal it and put it into our hand. Can only activate it if we control three or more artifacts. Then we've got a few creature lands with Crawling Barons times four, a great mana sink if we have a lot of mana to work with, as we can put two plus one plus one counters on it, in addition to turning it into a creature. Works well with the Forsaken Monument as well. Then we mentioned the Cascading Cataracts, could potentially play a second one in case one of them gets milled or exiled somehow. Could also play the World Tree as an additional copy that potentially fixes for Golos and doesn't require the one extra mana, but the downside there is that it doesn't make Golos mana for Forsaken Monument. And then four copies of Blast Zone, which gives us a bit of built-in removal in the mana base. Excellent against decks with lots of one drops, as we can sacrifice it right away to destroy them, but we can also slowly level it up to take care of larger permanents. And then, last but not least, four copies of Zalfurn Void, which when it enters the battlefield lets us scry one. Typically not one of the first lands we want to play, it's better to take a draw step or two to then make a more informed decision. Let's say we have an opening hand with three lands in it, then we can maybe wait to see if we draw fourth land before playing the Zalfurn Void, and then we can use that scry to maybe put an additional land on the bottom if we don't need it anymore. And then additional lands you could consider in the mana base include Buried Ruin to recur artifacts from the graveyard, could also play a few copies of Blink Moth Nexus as an extra creature land that plays well with our Forsaken Monument, could also play a copy of Arch of Araska to search up with Golos as an extra card draw engine, especially in these slower matchups, 
And then additional sideboard suggestions for Karn include Sorcerer Spyglass as a utility card that can shut down opposing activated abilities, mostly Planeswalkers. Could also play with Sky Sovereign Console Flagship to take out three toughness creatures, and then we can crew it using Karn's plus one ability to turn it into a nice 6-6 six, six creature. And that's also something we'll often do once we're locking people out with God Pharaoh's statue, is we can use Karn to turn it into a 6-6 six, six to quickly close out the game. So we don't have any basic lands in the deck, which could hurt us if the opponent is playing Field of Ruin, although that's not a card that you see very often in Historic nowadays, and it will hurt you if you combine it with Forsaken Monuments and need that one extra mana. Then we could also be playing Gigantha, the Wellspring, as companion, but that will eat up an extra sideboard slot, so I don't think it's really worth it. So yeah, that's our deck, now let's jump in some games and see how the deck does. Alright, we're on the play, and our hands is keepable, but we will need a little bit of help off the top, an extra ramp artifact, like for instance a Hedron Archive would be perfect. For now we can lead with a Crypt. Make sure we gain as much life as possible, which is very important when facing aggressive decks. As per Sentinel, not something we love to see, as our opponent's gonna get to draw a card here, but so it goes. Next turn we can pay for it if we play another Cold Steel Heart. So our opponent a green white human stack, and we see the nerfed Luminarch Aspirant, which now puts the counter end of turn instead. Which is a bit of a shame. So let's see. I can play Mindstone and pay the Esper Sentinel tax. And that's my turn, at which point I'm better off playing Cold Steel Heart. I think we just gotta ramp into Ugin as quickly as possible. So I'm not gonna pay the extra mana here. Alright, so we've got seven mana next turn. So we're not too far from Ugin, but an elite spellbinder could mess it up. A Ranger Captain of Eos could also sacrifice itself to prevent us from casting it in the first place. So, we'll see how this goes. Now, despite being an artifact creature, Asper Sentinel is white, so it does die to the minus X. And Forsaken Monument is not bad here, so I won't be able to pay the three mana tax. If I tap Cold Steel Heart first, do I have enough mana to then still play Ugin? I don't think so. Yeah, still gonna be a little bit short here. So we won't be able to pay the tax. But next turn we can play Ugin even if an Elite Spellbinder exiles it. And we're still at 20 life thanks to all the life gain from our lands, so should be able to survive to play Ugin. And then we can always use Blast Zone, if really necessary here. So we'll see if the opponent will sacrifice Ranger Captain to prevent casting Ugin. Of course, we could still cast an Ulamog. So we'll see if they go for it or not. And then I'm happy to use Blast Zone if they do sacrifice the Ranger Captain. So I'll hang on to Mind Stone instead of drawing a card with it. Alright, looks like our opponent's gonna sacrifice the ranger, so we won't be able to cast Ugin here. Another Mind Stone we also won't be able to play. So should I sacrifice Blast Stone right now? I think so, otherwise they could use the Initiates. And now our opponent doesn't have a ton of pressure in play. So hopefully they won't be sacrificing the second captain. Bodyguard protects Aspirant and another Asper Sentinel joins the fun. 
Make that two Esper Sentinels. And a Thalios Lieutenant. All right. So now they could definitely sacrifice Ranger and still have a lot of damage next turn. So I might have to sacrifice Mindstone here to try and draw into something else. Like maybe a Golos could save me. Might have to draw another Blast Zone. So Ranger Captain sacrificed, no again for us. And Golos the draw. Is that enough? It might not be. So I can get a Blast Zone, but it will enter the battlefield tapped, so I won't be able to use it right away. So I can block and still probably die. I guess I can gain two life of Golos. And the Forsaken Monument also gains life. And then Crawling Barons is an extra blocker, so I guess we're not necessarily dead here. Although they can use the Giant Killer to kill Golos. So we're at 11. Opponents out of the Ranger Captains to sacrifice. Collected Company main phase. Trying to find another Lieutenant, I'm sure. And a Brutal Cathar. And a Grizzled Huntmaster, so that's gonna grow the Lieutenant, which is a creature I have to block with Crawling Barons, and then I'm still taking... 9 damage. Opponent gets rid of Giant Killer, which they couldn't cast anymore. So what can they get with a Huntmaster that saves them? Another Lieutenant, perhaps, if they have a fourth copy in the sideboard. Doesn't look like it. So I get to block. We're at two. All right, so I get to untap. Finally time to cast Ugin. Can Mindstone first to gain a bit of extra life. And then do I want to pay the two? Don't really want him drawing a ton of cards. So if I pay two, pay two, I can still play Ugin. Yeah, I guess we pay the two. We also gain a bunch of life. So even a flash creature end of turn is not gonna get us. Minus three, get our Golos back, get another ETB trigger, and I think we stabilized. Golos can now search up Cascading Cataracts, so we can activate Golos. So we'll see. Questing Beasts, not bad. So that's what they probably searched up out of the sideboard. I guess I'll block and trade so we wouldn't be able to use Golos, but still have an Ugin in play and a Crawling Baron, so... Still like my chances. Can draw with a Mindstone. And we can activate Crawling Baron several times. And our opponent explodes. GG's. Very close game here against Green White Humans. On to the next one. Alright, we're on the draw. Our hands, okay, not amazing, but Mindstone into hopefully turn 3 car and turn 4 Golos can lead to good things and we'll be able to gain a bit of life in the process. 
up against a blue deck. Control decks are typically fine matchups since we have kind of inevitability in the late game with all our utility lands and our powerful curve toppers, especially Ulamog, still exiling two things even if it gets countered. And then Blast Zone can be great against kind of the mono blue tempo deck with lots of one drops. But this looks like your more typical control deck. Alrighty, so play Guardian Idol, can maybe use the mana for Mindstone later. Also gives us a way to pressure a potential Planeswalker. And then next turn, could try to play Karn, probably gets countered. Alright, Portable Hole, actually an answer to my Guardian Idol, unfortunately. So that's gonna slow us down. Now Blast Zone can destroy the Portable Hole. So for now, I guess uh, play Mindstone and pass. And then next turn, we all have to decide if we want to play Golos or Karn. Opponent passes with four mana up. So they could play like a memory deluge end of turn. We do have two copies of Karn, and Karn can also fetch Golos out of the sideboard. Playing Karn does play around like a conditional counterspell like Sensor. So it's a close call. The upside of Golos is that it also fetches a land. So if our opponent has Deluge as opposed to a counter spell, maybe going for Golos has higher upside. Alright, that resolved. So we'll get the Cascading Cataracts to potentially activate Golos in the future. Even though there's also an argument for getting an extra creature land. But we'll go with Cataracts. Right, opponent cycles Shark Typhoon for two. That's fine. So to activate Golos with Cataracts, we essentially need eight mana total. So we're not quite there yet next turn, but we're getting close. The Fairy shows up. Sadly, we don't have Sorcerer Spyglass to search up with Karn. But Golos can pressure to Fairy. We've got a Crawling Barons as well. And the shark's attacking. So our opponent could have two mana interaction here. After untapping two lands. Another Golos. So I think step one is going to be attack Golos on Teferi, as opposed to use Crawling Barons as well. If they remove Golos, then I can play Karn search up something powerful, or I can just go second Golos plus Cold Seal Heart, maybe that's better. And then take it from there. Karn could also turn one of my artifacts into a creature to apply additional pressure. So, quite a few options. Alright, that works. So this is probably getting countered then. It does not. That's minus. And then what to search? Could go for Forsaken Monuments, could go for Godfarrow Statue, those seem like the most impactful cards since I already have Golos in hand and in play. I guess we'll go with Monuments, more mana is never a bad thing. And then we'll add a Cold Steel Heart. Also very much possible that our opponent has some extra turns lined up with Alrun's Epiphany. 
and they just needed their Teferi to survive, no matter what loyalty to them pull ahead. We'll see. Next turn I can activate Golos, potentially play an Ulamog for zero mana, or an Ugin. But we don't want Teferi to stay in play for too long, of course. Char goes after Karn. The fairy draws. No time for a break. I guess Alrun's Epiphany now costs 7 mana, even from Exile, so they wouldn't be able to play that just yet. So her opponent passes. And then there's Ugin, now very likely to get countered. But, uh, yeah, I'm kind of interested in just activating Golos here. Which can also help me hit my land drops. And we might find a zero mana Ugin. Alright, we can play Voids. And a couple artifacts. Probably don't need Blast Zone. And then we can plus Karn. Could plus on the portable hole as well for what it's worth, but probably not necessary. I don't think I want to turn any of these into a creature and potentially lose it to a board wipe. So maybe I want to wait on using Karn, attack with Golos first. They cannot use Hull, and at most they can make a 4 4 shark. And then I might plus on the portable hole, so if they do cast a sweeper, I'll get my guardian idol back. Ah, it's gonna be a 4-4 shark. There was also an argument for maybe like attacking first, see if they make this play, and then playing Ugin second main to wipe the board. But I kind of like hitting my land drops here as well. So maybe I should actually plus on the archive. I potentially miss a bit of mana. But that gives me a blocker for Hall. In case our opponent goes for an extra turn and then animates Hall in their second turn. And I'm not going to be too broken up about losing my archive now that we have quite a bit of mana. So Shark finishes off Karn. And we take four. So we've not seen many counter spells from the opponent so far. Possible they just have a lot of author interaction in hand that doesn't quite line up, or they're just being patient to counter the heavy hitters like Ugin. We'll see. Opponent's looking at my mana to maybe count how much I have. Another portable hole. Exiling... Guardian Idol. Okay. So Blast Zone. Destroying double portable hole. Looking a little bit better now. Opponent foretells another card. Still three mana for an Archmage's Charm. Opponent foretells again, but of course they can still untap with the Fairy to have three mana available. Make that four. And a Gravedigger's Cage, not super relevant. So, kind of feels to me like they're maybe setting up a bunch of extra turns. So do I want to attack with Golos first? Can we use this at instant speed? We can. So I guess, hmm, not quite enough to kill Teferi. I could play Forsaken Monument if they counter it. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm not gonna have enough to activate Golos afterwards, but I might be able to activate Crawling Barons. So maybe step one is play Forsaken Monument, see if that resolves. If it gets countered, we just kill Teferi. 
Although there's still the potential concern of extra turns. So, yeah, let's start here. Play Monuments, which if it resolves also pumps Golos. Alright, Charm to counter it, fair enough. So now, could also play Karn plus on something to kill Teferi. Or we could go for Crawling Barons. Um, let's go for Crawling Barons. And then kill Teferi. And yeah, hopefully our opponent doesn't take a million extra turns here. The foretold cards could be Doomscar, could be Sod Coming. So our opponent's gonna move to combat, hit us for six. And yeah, Epiphany would do it here with the Hall of the Storm Giants. Right, it's going to be a backup to Fairy instead. So, don't have to worry about Alrun's Epiphany anymore. Hurry. So, probably means Doomscar or Saw it coming. Or a Behold the Multiverse, fair enough. So opponent will have three mana available once again after untapping. And I have to make that same decision of trying to cast spells or activate Golos while pressuring Teferi. So it's a tricky balance. We're also close to just dying to opposing damage. So yeah, it's rough. Ideally we can just hit an Ulamog with Golos, so I can exile Hall of the Storm Giants and maybe Teferi or a Shark. And then uh, we would be pretty safe. So maybe I should start by activating Golos, leaving Crawling Barons untapped if possible. Alright, there's Ulamog. So Hall's getting exiled, and then probably Teferi. Although, it's still kind of a close call. Our opponent could still counter Ulamog just to deny the Tantan Indestructible. At which point I can still play Karn and send a Mind Stone at Teferi to kill it. So maybe going Hall plus Shark is safest. And then we'll see if they want to counter this. Could also animate Crawling Barons to send at Teferi. That resolves. So do I want to Karn, turn on Mind Stone, and then have to animate the one that was already in play. Gain some life. Attack to ferry. Alright, so now that we hit Ulamog, I feel a little safer. Another behold from our opponents. And I mean, this is kind of the board state we want to get to when playing against control. A lot of mana, powerful threats, some of which are still effective even if they get countered. 
and try to keep our opponent from having too many planeswalkers active. So we'll see. Cast out, can exile Ulamok, that's fine. Still have an Ugin to potentially exile everything, although I don't expect it to really resolve. If we get Ulamog back, we don't get to exile two more permanents because it's a cast trigger and not an enters a battlefield trigger. And a Doomscar will finally wipe the board. Alright, so no hidden cards left to play around. We can resolve Ugin. And that should be pretty strong here. I also don't mind Karn minus gets a God Pharaoh statue, for instance. Which can uh, kind of shut the opponent out for the most part. And minus four. And then we'll play some more trinkets. And our opponent has seen enough. Oof, so close game here against blue white control. On to the next one. Alright, we're on the play with a decent hand. Could use an extra few lands, but. With the Scry from Void, we also get an extra look, so I'll try it. So this is an instance where I don't mind playing it right away, since we know for a fact we need an extra land. Forsaken Monument, I think, is too ambitious here. Can find it with Karn if we really want it. Alright, Fountain's great. And then I like playing Idol before Mindstone. Alright, so would still like an extra land, so we can curve Karn into a 5-drop. And we're up against a burn deck, so if they're only using burn spells, we usually have enough time to resolve our expensive cards. If they combine it with kind of prowess-type creatures, they could potentially deal enough damage to kill us. And here, I prefer double Mindstone over Karn, just to ensure more mana, so I can play Golos, keep hitting those land drops, and eventually play Ugin. So we're opponent a blue-red deck, potentially a Mystic Mastery deck. So Karn could get a Tormod Script to exile the opponent's graveyard, so they can't Mastery the uh, Magma Opus, but they might be able to do it right now. So make that a Jeskai deck. Alright. Don't need to worry about Archmage's Charm, at least. And we're getting close to Ugin mana, so if Golos resolves, then, um, you know, I could get there next turn. Also don't hate going for Karn and Tormod script, just to play it safe. And then don't need a Cold Steel Heart. Could have left up Guardian Idol mana to maybe hit for two. Don't think that matters too much. Alright, opponent's got a Shark Typhoon. So this could easily be a creativity deck, although they don't have a whole lot of red mana. So yeah, I think I'm just getting a Tormod script. And then next turn I can maybe still minus and get a five drop to cast like a Forsaken Monument. Can also put an extra counter on Blast Zone. So Tormal Scripts can shut down a Mystic's Mastery. Urza's Rage is unexpected, but that works. So now we should be able to resolve Golos, which gets us to Ugin, plus just using the ability is quite powerful. And then I think it's fine to level a Blast Zone by one. Alright, could just cast Ugin. I guess that's also fair. And 
then plus on the shark. So not entirely sure what deck our opponent's playing, some sort of Jeskai control combo hybrid. But we'll see if they have answers for Ugin. It's gonna be pretty tough to kill it with burn spells. So I guess we'll play Golos and then probably leave a blast soon. Or I could play an extra Cold Steel Heart. And then Golos can get Cataracts. Yeah, probably fine to play an extra Heart. And pass it back. So next turn I could even Ultimate Ugin. Which might be fun. Six mana for our opponent. And they explode. Yeah, just too many threats to deal with. Golos can activate. We've got some nice utility lands and an Ugin about to ultimate. All right, on to the next one. All right, we're on the draw, facing off against the Lurus deck. Now, if this is a Spirit Dancer deck, they usually kill us before we manage to do anything meaningful. If it's kind of your discard Arcanists sort of deck, then we can have some powerful top decks to get back into it. We've got the early ramp, so I think we can keep this, and then hopefully if we're up against the Spirit Dancer deck, we can cast a turn for Ugin, but it looks like the Arcanist variant instead. Turn on Thoughtseize. All right, so probably takes away one of our early ramp artifacts, and then... I could Void here to scry towards another 2-mana ramp artifact in case they have another Thought Caesar Inquisition to take away my heart, because I would really like to hit a 2-mana artifact. Karn's not bad, assuming, you know, I can cast it in time. Having a backup is not a bad idea. So, yeah, I guess I'll keep another Karn on top. It's just one of those must-answer cards. Alright, Channeler does give the opponents meaningful pressure and a second thought seize is unfortunate because now they can take away my cold steel heart and leave me unable to ramp into Karn or they could take a different approach take away my Karn which would be the preferred outcome given that we have another Karn incoming but our opponent takes the ramp card okay so do I want to void again I don't think so because even if I find another 2-mana ramp card, it's not that useful to me anymore. So I would rather wait and make a more informed decision with Void. Karn could minus get a Tormod script to exile the opponent's graveyard right away. Village rights to refuel. So your opponent off to a good start with some good disruption. Thought is of course, much better against her deck than a cheap removal spell would be. So we've got our work cut out for us. And we're likely to see a Croc on turn 4, which is going to be very hard to beat. So really need them not to have a 4th land so we can Karn and Tormod script. But there it is, so Croc is going to come out. And yeah, that's just going to be too much pressure for us to handle. So yeah, there you go. That's why those two mana ramp artifacts are so important, because if you have to play your four drop on turn four, it's just going to be too slow. And doesn't matter here. We're pretty dead. So I can play Karn, but I'm just taking too much damage next turn. I guess Tormod Scripts technically still lets me survive the Channeler hits if I discard a spell to Croxa, since the Channelers will shrink down. Also, I guess highlights the difference between play and draw, where if we're on the play, 
then we would have been able to exile their graveyard before Croxa comes in. Their opponent is attacking Karn. No, maybe. All right. And then what to discard here? So is there any way I can survive if I play lands, play Monument next turn, and then like top deck an Ugin? I'm going down to 10. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's my best bet, and I should just discard Karn. But I do need to draw a spell. There's Ugin, but I guess Hive gives him lethal here. So we actually still had somewhat of an out. I guess I need to top deck another Ugin after discarding. After going to one, but the Hive will get it done. Alright, GG's. On to the next one. Alright, we're on the draw with a fine hand. Idle into turn 3 Karn, hopefully turn 4 Golos. Facing Steam Vents. So it looks like Jeskai Control. Not a matchup we're too afraid of. And we've got a lot of powerful threats to ramp into. Starting with Karn. Serpon could easily have a Lightning Helix to deal 3. So there's an argument for plusing Karn. Since I already have a 5 drop to play next turn, so there's nothing I desperately need to get. And then keep Karn around for now. Do we see a Lightning Helix end of turn? Just a Magma Opus discarded. Alright. Could have gotten a Tormod script, I guess. Opponent passes. So now I don't mind minusing to get a Tormod script. Play that. And play a Golos. If they want to counter Tormod script, that's fine by me. And this can prevent a Gear Hulk from flashing back. Magma Opus. No interaction from our opponent. And this also resolves. Get our Cascading Cataracts. And pass it back. Man, our opponent explodes. Alright, they didn't like that Tormod script. On to the next one. Alright, we're on the play. And this hand is missing a 2 mana ramp artifact. So I'm afraid we have to mulligan. It's going to be too slow in most matchups. This I can keep, and then probably have to get rid of Ugin. Could also get rid of like six mana Ugin or even Karn, since we have Archive to play on four. And then we can just ramp into Ugin as our catch up mechanism. And then if we keep Ugin the Ineffable, that can also discount Spirit Dragon. So. There is an argument for getting rid of Karn, although the utility could be critical in a lot of matchups if we need Graveyard Hate, for instance. So it's a tough call. I guess we'll keep double Ugin and then hope to draw some lands. Alright, up against Green Whites. Call Seal Hearts, not a bad draw. Land would also be acceptable here. Alright, looks like an Abs on deck and a Thalia. Alright, that's gonna tax my non creature spells, which is all the cards in my hand. Luckily, we still have a bit of ramp. 
So land into archive would be pretty good. Spellbinder gonna disrupt that. So opponents on amps on humans. The black potentially for General Kudro as an extra anthem effect. All right, so the game plan is simple. A ramp into Ugin. We'll see what our opponent has to say about that. Definitely not the best start imaginable for us. All right, we found a land, so we get to play a Hedron Archive, which potentially sets up Ugin the Ineffable next turn. Four mana, another Spellbinder. Can take Ugin the Ineffable now. So, yeah, that's a lot of disruption out of the white deck. They couldn't cast Collected Company this turn because of their own Thalia, but they could still have it in hand for next turn, so... Not loving my position right now. Although, if we do resolve Ugin, that's probably good enough to stabilize. So our opponent takes a cheaper Ugin. Could imply that they have more ways to slow down the Spirit Dragon. But for now, we can double Mindstone, so next turn I could play the Spirit Dragon if there's no more disruption. And here even a Thalia's Lieutenant would not give them lethal. A Ranger Captain could still be very backbreaking, preventing us from casting non-creature spells, so that's what we want to avoid. And another Elite Spellbinder. General Kudro pumps the team. That's 11. So if they also have Lieutenant, we're dead. But they don't. Alright, we're at 3. And looks like we get to cast Ugin. Play around the 1 mana white counter spell. Play our land first. And don't need Cold Steel Heart. Alright, now Collected Company end of turn could still be problematic as our opponent can provide a bunch of threats end of turn, but uh, for now things are stable. And then next turn Ugin the Ineffable gains another life with Beacon, makes a blocker. So we'll see. Kudro destroys its own creatures to put them in the graveyard instead of exile. Not sure if that matters. So now collected company is what we're worried about. But our opponent explodes. All right. So Spirit Dragon wins it for us and uh, gets us to Mythic. Although looks like it's not quite showing up. All right, so Colorless Ramp, a deck that I think is decently positioned right now because of the rise of the Jeskai Control archetype, which preys on the creature decks. But on the other hand, if we end up facing a lot of those aggressive creature decks like Elves, those are usually fast enough to kill us before we manage to stabilize. So not sure what's going on here. We're Mythic with a, a diamond logo, but uh, I guess... Arena's having some issues lately. So yeah, despite the changes from uh, the latest Alchemy set, Historic is still a very fun format, and I highly recommend it if you're looking for something different than Standard and Alchemy. So that'll do it for today's gameplay. Wanna thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also wanna thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.